the distinction was that my age is not a weakness, it's a strength. And I had incredible insecurities about being a young speaker on stage. Statistically, I'm seven months older than half the age of the average. Um, and I thought, you know, I had incredible fears about that. Nobody's going to listen to me, take me seriously, want to hear what I have to say. And when we go back to that, back to that hierarchy, I'm not going to belong in this space. And that's what I realized was going to be my, my big problem. And now, you know, I've had, I've, I've been asked to speak at some incredible spaces with some incredible speakers to be at incredible events with people like you. And, uh, I, I don't want to attribute that to my age because I think there's obviously merit in the content and the material and the delivery, but I, I think I wouldn't have been able to get to that space had I still thought that my age was, was a weakness. Hi, I'm James Taylor, business creativity and innovation keynote speaker, and this is The Creative Life, a show dedicated to you, the creative. If you're looking for motivation, inspiration, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's an author, musician, entrepreneur, performer, designer, or thought leader. They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode, as well as free training on creativity, over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Eric Termonde. Eric is the co-founder of Now Innovations, a best-selling author and an international speaker. His work has been featured in Forbes, Inc., Thrive Global, and the Huffington Post, and the Global Mail from his local uh, Canada, where he's based. Termonde was recognized as a top 100 emerging innovator under 35 globally by American Express. He is a TEDx speaker and represented Canada at the G20 Summit. It's my great pleasure to have Eric with us today. So welcome, Eric. James, great to be here. I'm excited for the conversation today. So share with everyone what's happening in your world just now. Oh, you know what? It's been a fantastic uh, wrap to the year. Uh, I think 58 events this year, uh, speaking in multiple countries, all about a topic or a problem that I don't really think we're attributing to the right root cause. I mean, a lot of us think that in, in the corporate space, we've got a sales problem, a marketing problem, a leadership problem, a product or a time to market problem. And really, we've got a talent crisis. Engagement hasn't moved in the last decade. People in terms of um, mental health issues, dissatisfaction in the workplace, I mean, these issues have never been higher. And I think it's all because we're not being proactive in this talent attraction retention conversation. We're very much putting fires, trying to put fires out instead of preventing them from starting in the first place. So I'm, I'm coming in, I'm talking to industry associations, to, uh, to colleges and universities, to corporations about how to really win that war on talent. And I'm really excited about how the year uh, is wrapping up and, and how we can dive into 2019. And what was it specifically about this this topic? I mean, how did you come into this topic? What kind of what what made you passionate about kind of going around the world? I mean, fifty eight plus events this year, you know, traveling around, or sharing your message on it. What specifically was it that attracted you to it? It came from my personal struggles as well. I mean, I graduated at the University of Calgary uh, in in out here in Canada, in Alberta. And I did what most of my peers did. I applied to 60 to 80 different jobs. I changed that one line in the cover letter and surprise, surprise, that wasn't all that successful. It turns out that it wasn't just myself and my peers that were doing this. It was people of any different age group, whether you're in a mid-career transition or otherwise, that are applying to all of these different jobs uh, and finding that, you know what, nobody's actually happy in the work that they're doing. And so we thought, hey, you know what, maybe if we look at these job descriptions a little bit more critically, they don't actually describe the job. It's a skills and requirements checklist. And when we look at there being about 1.4 million accountants, just as an example, uh, in the United States alone, you could be an accountant at a golf course or for the municipality or for Deloitte or PwC or one of the big corporations or for a boutique firm. And, and what you do as a highly educated, highly skilled, highly intelligent individual is actually very similar from place to place. But the experience and the life that you live as a result is vastly different. And what I'm here to say is that there's no one universal best culture. James, you and I could have the exact same skill, but a totally different life that we want to lead as a result of that skill. And the more proactive we can be in terms of understanding what those cultural components are and what the life that people get to live as a result of the job is, the better we can identify that right talent and proactively build strong teams. Now, you and I, we met before in, in Detroit. We were both attending a great event by Josh Linkner called the Three Ring Circus. Phenomenal uh, event. Um, I, I can't remember. Some, I was chatting to someone there and they, they described this, you know, 
what is the what is the 2 a.m problem that you are solving for other people what is that thing that your clients they're waking up at they're lying there at two in the morning they're going oh i know he said because unless you can kind of connect with that so for your your audience people that the book you to speak at events the people that bring you to help with their organizations what is that single 2 a.m problem that they're having well i think we're seeing the the phrase or the or the or the cluster of phrases for this decade be disruption, change, innovation, and speed. And, and I think that while I'm not an innovation or change speaker, I think a lot of innovative best practices start with having the right people on the bus in the first place. Uh, and so I'm I'm seeing statistics like 72% of the companies on the Fortune 500 being gone by 2027, and that's alarming for a lot of big companies. Fair enough. And I think a, a big reason for that is that they do not have the ability to innovate or to change or to dis disrupt fast enough. And what I'm here to say is that if we proactively tackle this conversation and bring on the right people, really embrace what's polarizing and create this psychologically safe environment where everyone feels like they belong, that that'll translate to the bottom line, that'll translate to more innovative and best practices, and that will translate to a healthier company down the road. Now, one of the things you talk about in your book is this idea of the the fourth industrial revolution. So I, you know, so take, take us through, we, we hear like this idea of the fourth industrial revolution often talked about in terms of technological disruption. You know, take us through what's one, two, three. <laughs> where, where are we now with that? Yeah. So, I mean, first industrial revolution, we'll see largely steam engine. Uh, second will be the assembly line we saw uh, in the late 1800s. Third industrial revolution will be computing, essentially. Fourth industrial revolution will be artificial intelligence and sort of this exponential curve. While the fourth industrial revolution is really interesting to me, more interesting perhaps is the life that we live as a result of the fourth industrial revolution, specifically around the technology that we use and our, arguably our dependency of that technology. You know, I'm seeing now a, a study that came out just in the last month or so that we're living about 31 and a half hour days, meaning that if we have 24 hours in the clock and we're asleep for seven of them, uh, meaning we're awake for 17 hours, we're doing two things at once about 42% of the day because we've got this ability to multitask. Now, I think you and I can agree that when we're doing two things at once, we're not doing anything particularly well. And so how does the fact that we're checking our phones 85 times a day, that we're spending 10 hours in front of a screen, the fact that more um, households, both parents are working, that it's very difficult. I'm seeing in, in my home province, 50% of the population is living paycheck to paycheck. How is it that we can be innovative, that we can be creative, that we can have time to not just get to the line, but get ahead of it as well? And I think that that's a conversation that many corporations are having internally as well. It's not how do we just keep up? It's how do we get ahead? And I think that really what I'm coming in to say is that it's a talent issue that I think we need to solve first and foremost. So the two things you, you talk about when you speak and, you, um, and in your book as well is about finding talent, how you find the best talent for your organization, and then talking about the kind of retainment and how you build you know, relationships and how you kind of get the best, uh, you're going to unlock the potential in your people as well. So take us to, you know, to the, the finding bit. Um, I saw something today, someone shared something on social media. It was a job description and, the, and, and in the job description, it said, must have 25 years of social media experience. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I don't know who put that up, but like, like social media, how long is that? That's not been around. 2007, I think. Was yeah. Yeah. So what are, some of the com what are some of the common mistakes that you find the companies make it, it, on the, the kind of finding uh, piece? And obviously, a lot of our people are watching this, listening to this just now. They might not have you know big organizations and thousands of people. They might, it might just be a really small team, a small team of three or four people, and they're looking to take on that next hire. What should they be looking out for and what should they be aware of, especially when they're dealing with you know, millennials and, and new generations that are coming into the workforce? Yeah, the first thing I would say is that we don't actually look at this next generation as anyone who's different than the previous generation. I don't think that people change from generation to generation. I think the world around us certainly does. When we look at that base of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we need food, shelter, and water. Once we've got that, sure, then it's a sense of psychological, emotional, and physical safety. Now, really what we're saying is the things that we aren't in terms of the small organizations that you talk about are often our competitive advantage. There are differentiators. You know, not everyone's going to have a ball pit or a beer keg or a ping pong table or a dog running around in the office. And hey, you know what? I think that's great. A universal best culture doesn't exist, but an optimized culture for the people that are there certainly does. And that goes back to that accounting example. You know, we both could be doing the same job, but in a vastly different environment. And I think the more we understand our differentiators, the better off we'll be. 
Because what I'm seeing time and time again is that companies are really only advertising the perks and the benefits, not at all talking about the experience of the job. Mm. So again, mm. we've got an open office concept. You can work flexibly and remotely. We've got a ping pong table and a keg and a dog running around. Well, first of all, let's just say I don't drink. I don't know, nor am I not interested in playing ping pong. I'm allergic to dogs and I'm an introvert. <laughs> that environment all of a sudden isn't all that appealing to me, even though I might be very good at the job. Now, if another organization comes in and says, hey, this is our experience. We've got a, an intense work environment that's really, form, um, that's really uh, let's just say, warm, that's really sort of familial, that we can work in t pockets or teams of four uh, where we get the job done. We've got a results-based environment that is fairly uh, quick in terms of the work that we do. Uh, we've got a very structured process. We're very long-term focused, uh, and this is what it's going to be like to work here. Now, all of a sudden, we get past the skills and requirements and the education of the job, that checklist that the job description notoriously has been, and we get into more of that life design based on the work that we do. I don't actually think it's about work-life balance anymore. I think it's an integration of work and life, where it's just life and now work becomes a part of it. Because we like to think that culture or that work experience is a nine to five transactional experience when very much it's the life that we choose to live as a result of the job that we're doing. So if we've got a nine to five transactional environment, hey, that's great. A lot of people are going to want that, and there's nothing wrong with it at all. Similar to say that you might have a 7 to 7 or a 7 to 9 environment. There's nothing wrong with that either. There's only something wrong with it when we think that there's a universal best culture or umbrella that we need to fit under. Now, I like to say that as soon as we try and imitate another company based on their culture, that's when we start to fall off. Instead, we need to be inspired by those characteristics or those emotions and those feelings, bring them back, innovate internally, and create an environment that's optimized for us based on the experience that our team wants to have. And then once once you you, you start bringing people into that organization, there's obviously there's a there's a good fit there. Um, uh, they, they they come in, they they can they have their initial induction kind of training, you know, the, 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 the usual things there. And as they start to um, uh, what's, it, what's it, what that, that phrase? It's storming, norming, and something. You know, where they, where they, where they, they start to kind of get in. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, especially for newer generations that are coming in into the workforce. I mean, certainly the, the people, all my team are, all my my team are probably under 25. Uh, I would say, um, and so previous generations felt like it was much more about like hierarchy, about developing. For my team, it seems to be much more about personal development, giving them skills, you know, um, opportunity, you know, experiences is being being a bigger thing as well. Uh, so once people are in those organizations, what can we do to to really ensure that we're we're getting tapping into the best, the most, the, the greatest kind of cre creative potential? I think, again, this goes back to being proactive in this conversation, too, and understanding up front what that individual is going to need to feel successful. Now, I want to be clear. I don't think this recruitment retention conversation is all about catering and accommodating to and bending to this next generation or next individual. I, I actually think it's the opposite. I think it's really about being intentional about the environment that we want to create in our team and not trying to attract millennials or males or females or any sort of uh, you know subset of individuals. I think it's really about saying this is the type of individual that's going to thrive here. And instead of trying to attract 90% of the population or, or at least intending to, we only look to try to attract maybe 1%. Uh, because it's not 1% of the population that we're looking to fill that position. It's just one individual. And I think inherently we've got this scarcity mindset thinking there aren't enough people out here. We'll never find anyone. Uh, and that we want to fill this position overnight. I think if we're patient in the process and utilize the staff that we have on hand and understand the life that they live as a result of that job as well and tell that story more effectively through our personal and professional channels that these people come out of the woodwork pretty quickly because they're already friends with and value the same things as our existing people already value. And I think that's uh, where a lot of the work can be done for us. Let's go back to your journey. You, you, I know you kind of left, kind of got out of college decided to kind of beat your, your your own path develop this career as an author as a as a speaker can you talk to us about a time where you worked on something you gave it your your heart and your soul you gave it everything but for whatever reason it didn't work out 
like you'd hoped? And more importantly, what was the lessons that you took from that in terms of building resilience for yourself? Yeah, I mean, my entire goal uh, in post-secondary school and before was to become a white-collar consultant. <laughs> That's what I wanted more than anything else. That's what I thought it meant to be successful. And um, when I didn't get that opportunity, I felt that I had spent five years and all this money and all this time uh, in post-secondary, and it was kind of all for naught. And that's what sort of started to develop the idea that, hey, maybe the problem that I had is solvable, not just for myself, but for others as well. So my co-founder and I at the time then decided to build uh, a survey, uh, an online tool that quantified workplace culture so we could differentiate that experience in terms of numbers. I mean, we had some pretty interesting clients that, you know, across the country with government down to the states and um, really started to have a different view on what it meant to have a good, thriving culture, one that you know, we suggested that one size shoe doesn't fit on every size foot. And to suggest that it does simply just excludes a lot of people that might be a great fit for the environment. So you, you kind of launched that product. You kind of got, yep. got, got that out there. Uh, yep. Talk about, you know, what happened when you, as you were kind of, you were kind of putting that out there. You're a, you're a 22 year old HR consultant coming fresh out of school who doesn't have a ton of work experience. It's an uphill battle to say the very least. We're rolling a very large rock up a very steep hill and to suggest that there weren't learnings and failures and stumbles along the way would be a gross misunderstatement. Um, and so we had great clients, we had great successes and we had a lot of learning and stumbles and trips and falls along the way as well. What, what I realized in that process is while I do like working with these companies and extracting and finding all this information about culture and about the environment, I really liked more of the research and speaking side of it. So when it came to our clients and when it came to my co-founder, who was very academic, really rolled his sleeves up and got into the organization and did some incredible work, I like being more of the evangelist and on the marketing side of talking about the sort of macro developments of what we're seeing in terms of culture uh, and how we can optimize that experience. I mean, there's a lot of rhetoric around culture, saying let's put people first or bring human back or, you know, culture eat strategy for breakfast. And I think, you know, a lot of these, while well intended, don't have a lot of meat. I can see those those posters up on the, on the walls of the office now, usually with a whale. There's usually a, there's usually a whale or, or a tiger or something. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the success ones are just like the tip of the iceberg. And yeah. You can see them. Yeah, it's, they're all the same posters. And, and I think it's not that those messages aren't important and they're not true. It's that they very rarely have actionable items that, that you can really grab onto yeah. and, 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 and move forward on. And so we took the research that we did and the consulting and the understanding that we did of this conversation, paired that with a lot of future of work reports, a lot of in-depth research about the work environment and just cultural understanding. And then I started to build a speaking career and ultimately wrote my book, Rethink Work, uh, on this topic as well. So that 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 move, it's almost like a bit of a pivot there in terms of going out and thinking, okay, I, I can actually perhaps impact more people by going out and hitting the road, getting up on stages, obviously, and writing as well. Um, you've gone through that entire university, you know, period where you're learning lots of book learning. Uh, I'm guessing you didn't learn too much about like presenting on stage, how to, you know, all, all, all the stuff that you have to do as a speaker. So how did you develop your, your, your skills, your, your chops really, um, in terms of kind of getting up there on stage and, and having impact and, and creating change with audiences? Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest at risk of self-sabotage here. It's a constant learning pro process, you know, to say that I've mastered it now is totally inaccurate. I mean, you and I are my, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I might have an epiphany or a breakthrough moment on this conversation here today that will totally transform the way I present and deliver tomorrow. And so the way that I look at, at keynoting or at presenting on stage is that each presentation is a proof of concept from an idea or something that I wanted to try based on the last one, but also a practice and a learning and a springboard for the next one to come. And so I'm not sure if we've got people who are just listening or if there's a, a visual today, but there's sort of my progress board. And you know, <laughs> those who are just listening, there are about 200 name tags on, on, a, on a board that I've got that sort of remind me of the progress in, uh, made, but also to, you know, let me know that there's a lot of work left to do. And and what I love about this job most is that depending on how you look at it, there's a finish line or a, you know, a milestone every event that you do, or you could argue that the job's never done. 
the potential is limitless. The, you know, there are always things that you could do better and improve on. And I think, you know, we mutually know our friend Josh Linkner, and he's a great role model and mentor to see what's possible in this space, you know. And there are so many people in this industry who are, you know, generous of their time and willing to help out. And so I guess to answer your, your question in a more concise way, it's it's a lot of practice. It really is. It's nothing more than like shooting a basketball at four in the morning. If you ask Kobe Bryant, it's just getting out there, doing the best you can, learning, being good with feedback, being as coachable as possible and know that the job's never done. And so in, in the world that you inhabit a lot of time, which is around HR, future of work, you often hear like things like 360 degree feedback and, and stuff like that. So, so I'm intrigued like from a perspective of a speaker, how, how do you get feedback? Feedback on, on, your, on your keynotes? Is it other people? Is it trusted mentors? Is it watching videos of yourself you know, on stage? Um, how do you go and assess like what you need to work on, what needs to be developed next? All of the above is is the short answer. The longer answer is that you've got a few key people in your network that will give you very crass, candid feedback about <laughs> doing. And it's really hard to take and extremely necessary at the same time. I remember going to Josh and you know asking him to shred my work, and he did. And it was tough for the first half hour, and I am infinitely grateful for the fact that he did. You know, and yeah. it's. Uh, it's videos, it's reading, it's watching other speakers. And, and originally I had a phobia of watching other speakers because I didn't want to mimic or you know replicate their style because I think thought leadership doesn't really exist as much as delivery leadership does. So I really like watching comedians and I like watching people who've got this different art form of delivery of speech and singers and performers and dancers. Um, because the originality of the delivery is fascinating, but there's very little that I think many of us in the speaking space are going to say that in principle we haven't heard or thought of before. It's, it's how we deliver it and how we connect the dots that are that are brand new and the stories that we tell as a result. As you mentioned that, uh, I, I, I did a similar thing you know, to yourself, get, you get feedback. I've got a couple of uh, mentors and great speakers or friends of mine who do the same thing and uh it reminds me a little bit in pixar they had the brain trust where you would go in with an idea and most of the time it would happen in the morning and most of the time if you were going and pitching an idea or putting something forward in the afternoon you'd have to go and take the afternoon off uh because you were so demolished yeah. by, <laughs> by the end of it oh, you're like seven of the best like people from animation just yeah. going and yeah. picking holes and finding everything on obviously it made you better but in the moment and probably for the first next couple of hours is actually a pretty brutal thing and then you you take a breath and you mentioned that you know i'm with you on on, on the the humor and the comedy i was just watching a great series of master class with steve uh, martin uh just now the master class lessons yeah yeah and he and he, he actually said something and i was like oh, I'm, i want to use this i want to use this and he, he said uh but this idea about speaking to what is truthful and mm -hmm. uh, he said, so for example, if you're in a, you're playing a really like a real dive of a comedy club, you would you would you would make a point. You you would say, wow, you know, 25 years building my speaking career, and I'm you know finally right. you know finally here, finally this, yeah. and that's one yeah. way of that's one way of doing it. Um, but actually, you can flip it depending on on what your your brand is. And so I for me, I I I don't think I could do that because that's not like who I'm about. I'm not really negative in that way. So but you can actually flip it and have fun with it. So you can actually go to the opposite extreme and, and you could just go in, wow, what what an, what an incredible comedy club this is. What an amazing club. You know, I was just, I was just talking to the rats in the, in the dressing room backstage and we were just talking about this. And so you can, you know, you can have, fun. and I love that just going, choosing like whether it's music, like big shows or comedy or even dance and theater and stuff not going to the usual places uh so you can develop your own kind of unique kind of voice there i'm talking about unique voice as you've been developing your own unique voice and and building your speaking career was there a a key aha moment or a light bulb moment where you went okay this is this is what i want to be known for or this is the direction i want to take or you made some very important distinction that's really changed the direction of what you do now the distinction was that my age is not a weakness, it's a strength. And I had incredible insecurities about being a young speaker on stage. Statistically, I'm seven months 
older than half the age <laughs> of the <animals. laughs> um, And I thought, you know, I had incredible fears about that. Nobody's going to listen to me, take me seriously, want to hear what I have to say. And when we go back to that, back to that hierarchy, I'm not going to belong in this space. And that's what I realized was going to be my, my big problem. And now, you know, I've, had, I've, I've been asked to speak at some incredible spaces with some incredible speakers to be at incredible events with people like you. And uh, I, I don't want to attribute that to my age because I think there's obviously merit in the content, the material and the delivery. But I think I wouldn't have been able to get to that space had I still thought that my age was was a weakness. So that was a big aha moment to suggest that people were seeing me as a differentiated speaker, not because of you know, I was speaking on culture, which many people do, but because I had a fresh perspective on culture. So I, I would I would classify myself as a respectful contrarian, suggesting that maybe the things that we thought were best practices in terms of people and culture, maybe maybe there's a better way of doing it. And through the journey that I take people on that keynote, it's about uh, empowering people to think in a way they hadn't thought before so they could build their own opportunities, knowing that if I said, here's 10 steps to build the best culture in North America or Europe, it, it doesn't work. I mean, like you said, a small firm of three or four, or a small team of eight competing against, I don't know, the Bank of England, it's a totally different game. And I think that instead, if we look at here are the things that we need to look at and here are the things we need to challenge, here are the questions that we need to ask and equipping these individuals and these leaders and these managers with the tools to take away, to identify that on their own and build an empire as a result. Empire being a very subjective term, empire could be that small giant like Bo Berlingham talks about in his book, uh, that it's not necessarily about you know striving to that same point of this artificial unicorn that is success. It's about defining, creating it on our own term, proactively developing our culture and creating a life for ourselves and our people that ultimately we can be proud and fulfilled of. So as we start to finish up, a couple of quick fire questions for you. Um, do you have a, an online resource or an app or a mobile app that you find pretty indispensable for the work that you do? There are a lot of sort of like news apps that I'm looking at right now, but Fast Company is my favorite uh, online just for case studies, corporate turnarounds, understanding these uh, spaces a little bit more. But Blinkist is another sort of short business book read. But it, it, it takes a book and condenses it into about a 15 minute read with all the key points and highlights. And if I really like the blink, they call it, uh, then I'll go buy the book and read the whole thing. Otherwise, it's nice to get a summary of what those books are and just have a brief understanding of what it means. And talking about books, if you do recommend one book you think people should check out, it could be on company cult culture, workplace culture, future of work, or something completely different, what would that book be? Well, I'll self-promote for half a second and say pick up Rethink Work. Uh, definitely would recommend that. <laughs> but uh, I would say that uh, Small Giants by Bo Burlingham was, was a transformational book uh, for me. It taught me that success doesn't have to be the biggest consulting company in the highest tower of the tallest building downtown. Um, it's really about creating a life that uh, ultimately makes you happy and defining success on your own terms. And there was a series of case studies that were exemplified through that book that really brought it to life for me. Craft breweries, um, Cliff Bar was another example yeah, of how they right. sell to Quaker and uh, Pepsi or, or whoever that might be. And it's just like, hey, you know what? I always thought we had to like 10x and hyper growth and scale and scale and scale. And, you know, that book doesn't advocate against growth and development and learning, but it really redefines in a way that's right for us. And I really appreciated that. One of the things that uh, I got a chance to meet uh, Gary from Cliff Bar on a number of occasions. And one thing yeah. that they do is quite fun with the company culture is they have mm. a, a, a Cliff Bar band. Uh, it's like okay. a, a big band because because Gary's very into jazz and, and everything. So and they compete with other bands, other company yeah. bands around the Bay Area yeah. as well. Amazing. So and obviously where you are today, you're you're in Vancouver, part of Vancouver. Lots of really cool startups. Um, sure. uh, I think Hootsuite. I think are pretty much around right. where you are. There's there's really cool companies there. Um, if you were to recommend, you've also got lots of cool bands. So if you were to recommend one album uh, to to people to check out, it could be on a You've got a lot of wonderful Canadian artists or it could be some something else. What would that album be? Oh, man. I think my favorite album of all time is Californication by Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, all the way through, I, I love that album. Um, I'm just trying to think then what have 
Canadian artists. Canadian artists had a great year in 2017. We had Drake, we had Shawn Mendes, we had Justin Bieber, and we had The Weeknd on top four slots of the Billboard for a little bit. You obviously put something in the water there because you have some incredibly, for, for a country of its size, the number of, of a population, the number of amazing music artists. I, I, I put it all down to the weather, personally. I think if you have to be inside for so many hours in a day of the bad weather, then, then you're going to do some creative stuff. You like the Scandinavians. Well, yeah, we're lucky here in Vancouver. Where it, uh, it might snow once, maybe twice a year, but you're right. In Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, it is uh, it is quite chilly. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe that's it. But uh, you know, another favorite, a little closer to home for you, would be that the Mumford and Sons. Oh, yeah. um, uh, and I'm I'm a big fan of them. I saw them live, and it was probably the best show I've seen. Fantastic. And uh, final question for you: I want you to imagine you woke up tomorrow morning, and you have to start from scratch. So you've You've got all the knowledge you've acquired over the years, but no one knows you. You know no one. Uh, you have to start from scratch. What would you do? Hey, you know what? I like to treat every day kind of like that. You know, uh, every day I'm trying to de- develop that library of knowledge from yesterday. And, you know, <laughs> I- I'm going to show my cards a little bit here. Uh, I was put forward for the IASB showcase, uh, the International Association of Speakers Bureau showcase, to be on stage. And, you know, world class speakers. <laughs> and I got shortlisted. You know, I, I was a finalist on it, but ultimately didn't get it. And uh, I got my feedback chart and it said, chances that members of IESB will know the speaker. And it was 100% not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, oh, like you said, that feedback, it's like tough to take. And it's a really great starting point. And so to answer your question, I would, and I'm in the process of a full rebrand right now, really consolidating the message making sure to, in Josh's terms, putting all my eggs in one basket, really setting my stake and my flag in the ground and really establishing my space, knowing that my space is going to be different than any other speakers. You know, we talked about this, whether it's innovation, creativity, disruption, there'll be countless speakers on this space, but you've got your differentiating component. Josh has got his differentiating component. Sean Canungo, a big fan of mine, or sorry, I'm a big fan of his. Uh, he's got his stake in the ground and uh, I'm really looking to differentiate who I am through the brand that I develop and, and really hammer the market with that. So um, know too that, or, you know, at least in my perspective, you know, an overnight success takes a thousand days. Patience and resiliency is incredibly important. Being coachable, flexible and uh, with that growth mindset is really important too. And know that if I think I've got something totally right and established today, you could say one line of six words that could totally rock me to the core and change everything moving forward. So to answer your question, simplest terms, um, it would be about really establishing my space in the market, um, really branding and marketing that accordingly uh, and doing a lot more of what I'm doing, just probably in a smarter way, which is what I'm working on right now. And if people want to reach out to you, learn more about you, obviously the book and everything else you've got going on, what's the best place? Where should they go to do that? Yeah, I mean, ericturmundy.com. That's my uh, personal w- website. I'm sure there'll be a link. But uh, if anyone wants to connect via LinkedIn, that's my primary social media platform. Uh, I'm the only Eric Termundi out there, so it should be pretty easy to find. And I'm happy to have a conversation with anyone who wants to chat. Well, Eric, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing about your creative life. I wish you all the best with your speaking. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to share the stage at some event in the future. I hope so. Thanks so much, James. If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.